purpose of this video is to illustrate how to use the truth table method to answer true-false questions. Some of the true-false questions can be quite tricky and they require quite a lot of mental juggling to understand. So in, as an aid, it's a great thing to draw a picture that illustrates all the underlying concepts so that you can clarify your thought process. Well, this video is just going to illustrate a bunch of examples. These first two sentences are especially easy. The negation of a contradiction is a tautology. I hope that you can see that this is true just by reading it and thinking about it a bit. But when you're thinking about it, notice what you're doing. You're saying to yourself, the negation of a contradiction. Well, you're thinking to yourself, a contradiction is a formula that's always false. So if I negate a contradiction, if it was always false to begin with, Negation just turns it into the opposite value, so it makes it always true, and that's what a tautology is, is a formula that's always true. Well, notice that is quite a lot of words, and though it's fairly easy to understand, I think you'll see that it's even easier if we draw a picture. Let's get the pencil to work here. Come on, pencil. Okay, so for all of these sentences, you'll see me say, let's just start with a line that represents the top of a table. Now let's take the information from the sentence and put it on the table. We're talking about the negation of a contradiction. Well, what's a contradiction itself? A standard contradiction is a formula of the form P ampersand tilde P. All right, so there's a contradiction. We're talking about the negation of a contradiction. Well, to negate this, we want to put it in parentheses and put a tilde out front. Okay, so the negation of a contradiction. Now, on the table, what do we know about a contradiction? We know that it is always false. Notice you could do this with just a two-row truth table, or sometimes I feel it's more intuitive to do it with four rows, but it really makes no difference whatsoever. So if the contradiction itself is always false, and if you negate a column of F's, then you get a column of all T's. So, the negation of a contradiction is a tautology? The answer is obviously, yes, this is true. If it wasn't true when you just thought about it, I hope that this picture makes it obviously true. Now, Let's point out that there are variations. You, you don't have to do exactly what I just did. There are different ways to do this. You could start with the top of a table, and it says the negation of a contradiction. Well, I like to illustrate contradictions with a contradiction symbol, and so instead of drawing an actual standard contradiction, you could just use this symbol. And then you're saying the negation of a contradiction. And as I pointed out, in most cases, it's really perfectly acceptable to do this with a two-row table. So, the negation of a contradiction is a tautology. Yep, this little example illustrates the very same thing as this other one. Number two, the negation of a contingency is a contradiction. Well, this one's also pretty darn easy, but let's draw a picture. If we're going to talk about a contingency, you might actually write the word contingency, or even better, say, abbreviate it. What's important is that what it looks like. A contingency is some combination of T's and F's. So let me just start with a two-row example. A contingency can be true, can be false. Well, if I negate a contingency, what's it going to turn into? It's false and true. If you start with a combination of T's and F's and you negate it, you're going to get the opposite combination of T's and F's. Is there any way to start with a contingency and then negate it and end up with a contradiction? No. T's and F's are never going to turn into all F's by negation. So that little picture shows this is false. Again, you know, the details aren't absolutely essential here. I could have said negation of a contingency. Well, we'll just designate a single letter to be a contingency, and then I'll write underneath it some combination of T's and F's. And as I said, you could use two rows or you could use four rows. 
if I negate a contingency that's TFTF, it becomes FTFT. -T. So once again, the negation of a contingency is another contingency. These next four sentences all have a lot in common. Um, the first one says a conjunction which has a tautology as one of its conjuncts is always true. Well, there's a lot of words there. In theory, you can do this in your head, but that's not a good strategy. Much better to draw a picture. So, let's start with the top of a table. And it says we're talking about a conjunction. Well, a conjunction is a formula that has an ampersand as its main connective. It has a tautology as one of its conjuncts. Okay, let's put a tautology on one side or the other. I'm just going to abbreviate that tautology. So we have a tautology on one of its conjuncts. We don't know anything about the other one, so I'll just use a question mark. All right, now let's start filling stuff in. We know that a tautology is a formula that's always true. It seems to me in this case a two-row table is just fine. So tautology, ampersand, and we have no idea what's on the other side. So let's just put the two possibilities, true and false. Well, true ampersand true, that's true. True ampersand false, that's false. Because an ampersand is true only when both parts are true. Oh, well here's our result. A conjunction that has a tautology as one of its conjuncts is always true. No, it's definitely not always true. That is definitely false. And the picture, I hope, makes it obvious. All right, number four, very similar. But now we're talking about a conditional. So start with the table. A conditional, of course, has an arrow as its main connective. Its antecedent is a contradiction. Well, let me put contradiction on this side. Contradiction arrow and it doesn't tell me anything about the consequent. So I will put in a question there. Remember, the antecedent is what becomes before the arrow. The consequent is what comes after. So here we have a conditional whose antecedent is a contradiction. Does it always have to be true? Well, let's find out. A contradiction is always false. Don't know anything about the consequent. So let's try both possibilities, true and false. Now, false arrow true? Well, yes, that comes out to be true. False arrow false also comes out to be true. Remember that an arrow is true unless you have the T arrow F case. This is the only time that an arrow comes out to be false. So if you have a contradiction in the antecedent, then the conditional is going to be true, and so this is true. All right, uh, number five. A disjunction that has a contradiction is one of its disjuncts. Well, what's a disjunction? A disjunction, of course, has a wedge as its main connective, and it says that we have a contradiction as one of the disjuncts. All right, a contradiction on one side don't know anything about the other side. Contradiction is always false. And the other side, there's only two possibilities, true or false. If you have a contradiction as one disjunct, do you always have to be false? Well, false wedge true is true. False wedge false, however, is false. Aha! So a disjunction which has a contradiction is one of its disjuncts is always false. No, this is false. Because if whenever the other side is true, the whole thing would be true. Because a wedge is true if at least one of the parts is true. All right, number six. The conjunction of two contingencies can be a contradiction. This is the tricky sentence on this page. So, we're talking about a conjunction, and it's the conjunction of two contingencies. Well, that means contingency, ampersand, contingency. So let me put in true-false, and then true-false on the other side. Now I have two contingencies. 
And then I say true ampersand true is true. False ampersand false is false. And so the conjunction of two contingencies can be a contradiction. Well, it looks like you put together two contingencies and you get another contingency. But here's the difficult thing about these. When you're drawing the pictures, you can't always just draw the picture and immediately get the answer. You've got to realize that what you're doing is aiding your intuitions. Both of these are contingencies, but these I have made the contingencies the very same thing. A contingency is any combination of T's and F's. So notice, here's an alternative way that I could have done this. It's a conjunction of two contingencies. What if I said, I'm going to make this one true-false, and I'm going to make this one false-true? Now I have true and false is false, and false and true is also false. So here's a conjunction of two contingencies that in fact does turn out to be a contradiction. And so the conjunction of two contingencies can be a contradiction? That's actually true. This number six here represents the fact that sometimes these true-false questions require that you be creative in how you draw the pictures and how you think about what's going on. It's, this method isn't the way that these first three examples made it look, that you just draw the table and you immediately get an answer. You've got to be mentally engaged in the drawing process. And my suggestion is this, that you take it as your specific goal to draw a picture that would show that the sentence is false. So when I drew this picture, I wasn't mentally engaged trying to think to myself, how can I make the sentence false? I just drew it automatically without thinking. Then I stopped and I said to myself, well, wait a second. Contingencies don't always have to go TF, TF. It's any possible combination. So let me play around a little bit. And I realized that there was a way for me to make it false. So that's really the hard part of these, of these questions is that you've really got to be thinking about the table and kind of playing around with the ideas as you're working on this. So make it your goal to draw a picture that would show that the sentence is false. If you succeed, well then you know it's false. If you can't succeed, you know, if every picture you draw makes it true, well, it's, that's not a guarantee that the sentence has to be true. But what it does is it, it helps you, hopefully the process of trying to make it false, if you may fail, will illuminate why it has to be true. These four sentences are about arguments. Every argument that has a contradiction for a conclusion is a valid argument. All right, well, we start as always with the top of a table. Go on, pencil. And... There we go. When I'm talking about an argument, it seems to me that the most natural way to do this is to think about premise one, premise two, and then some conclusion. So here's an argument across the top of a table. And we're saying that it has a contradiction for a conclusion. Okay, so underneath the conclusion, I'm going to put a contradiction. And you know, most of the time it's perfectly fine just to use a two-row table. Sometimes four-row tables seem more natural. It has a contradiction for its conclusion, and it doesn't tell me anything about the premises, so I can put in anything I want. Now, if you think about a table, when you're checking an argument to see if it's valid or invalid, what are you looking for? Well, you're looking for a counterexample, of course, and a counterexample is a row where all the premises are true and the conclusion is false. If your conclusion is a contradiction, would it be possible to get a counterexample? Well, in fact, this would be the easiest possible case. Just designate a row where the both of the premises come out to be true and the conclusion false, just like this. And so, yeah, an argument that has a contradiction for a conclusion is valid. 
No, if you have a contradiction for a conclusion, you don't necessarily have to be valid. Here's a case where we have a contradiction, and yet we also have a counterexample. So sentence number seven is definitely false. Number eight says more or less the opposite. No valid argument has a contradiction for a conclusion. All right, so this is, I think, you know, the wording makes this a bit more complicated. But again, let's just get stuff on the table and get our intuitions working. So premise one, premise two, a conclusion. And again, we have a contradiction as the conclusion. So this time, I'll just go ahead and do a two-row table, just to, just to be different. A no valid argument has a contradiction for its conclusion. Well, we've got the conclusion is a contradiction. Could this argument be valid? The, that is, do we have to have a counterexample here? Well, what if we just say, let's make this one true-false, and let's make this one false-true? Now, there is no counterexample, and so this argument turns out to be valid. So no valid argument has a contradiction for a conclusion. This is also false. Now, how did I know to put in these values here? Remember, your goal should be to specifically try to draw a picture that would make these things false. And so that's what I did. I had to understand that a counterexample was what was important. Is this the only picture that would work? No, on the contrary. Another way to do it would be to just say, well, let's make one of the premises a contradiction as well. If you have a contradiction in the premises, then the argument is definitely valid. But having a contradiction as the conclusion does not make it valid or invalid. And that's sort of the underlying idea. There's a lot of complexity here, a lot of places to get tripped up, but the pictures are the best avenue for getting clarity about what's going on. All right, number nine. Every argument that has a tautology for a con its conclusion is a valid argument. All right, so this is the same as number seven, except that we've switched out tautology for contradiction. Let's again draw a picture. Premise one, premise two, the conclusion. The conclusion is a tautology. Okay, that's always true. Put in a couple of T's. Every argument that has a tautology for its conclusion is a valid argument. This time, this is going to be true. Because you need a counterexample here. And a counterexample is all premises true and conclusion false. Well, it doesn't matter what you put in here. You can say true, true. Well, that's still going to be, that's not a counterexample. You could say, well, let me put in true, false. That's not a counterexample. You could say, well, let me put in false, false. And still, that would be false, false, true. That's also not a counterexample. It doesn't matter. If your conclusion is true, then the argument will be valid. Remember, tautologies are self-proving formulas. And if the tautology is in the conclusion, it will definitely be valid because all premises entail every tautology. Number 10, no argument that has tautologies for all of its premises is invalid. Okay, so one more example here. You've got premise one, premise two, and a conclusion. And this time we know that all the premises are tautologies. So true, 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 true. And an argument which has tautologies for all of its premises is invalid. No argument with tautologies at premises is invalid. So can we make this invalid? And the answer is yes. This would be the easiest case to make invalid. True, true, false. Here, premise is true. Make the conclusion false on any row. You could have a contradiction here, which would make it a counterexample on every row, or you could have a contingency here, but where you would maybe just have one counterexample, but that's enough to make it invalid. So no argument that has tautologies for all its premises invalid? That is definitely false. 
These next four sentences are about entailment, so probably a quick review of the concept of entailment on a table would be a good idea. Um, I've already constructed a table for these three formulas. Let's call them A, B, and C just to make it easy to refer to them. We can ask which formulas are entailed by A. Well, there's only two here, so what we're really asking is does A entail B and does A entail C? The entailment symbol is the turnstile. Notice that's the same symbol that we use for validity. Entailment and validity are basically the same relationship. In fact, when we ask, does A entail B, we're really asking about the argument from A to B, is it valid? If the argument from A to B is valid, then A does entail B. Well, the bottom line is we're looking for a counterexample, a T to F from A to B. So, do we find a T to F when we compare each row of the relationship between A and B? The answer is yes, we do. Well, a counterexample means that the argument is invalid, and so A does not entail B. That's what we're looking for. Now we can ask from A to C. Does formula A entail formula C? And here, the answer is yes, it does, because you see a T to T, F to T, another F to T, and an F to F, but you never find a counterexample and so A does entail C. We can do the same thing for B. Does B entail A? B entail A? B entail C? Well, F to T, F to F, F to F, ah, but then here on the last row we do find a counterexample, and so we say no, B does not entail A. And of course, we also have a counterexample on the fourth row from B to C, so no, B does not entail C. Does C entail A? No, nope. counterexample on the second and the third row. Does B, C entail B? No, we have three counterexamples. And of course, that's not surprising because notice tilde R wedge S is just the opposite of R wedge S. So hopefully that made sense. You find a T to F and you say no entailment. If you'd like to understand entailment at a little bit more intuitively, think about it this way. R and S means that both parts are true. That's kind of the intuitive way to think about an ampersand. R wedge S means at least one part is true. If R and S is true, does R wedge S have to be true? Yes, because if R and S is true, both parts are true, and so that means at least one part has to be true. So R and S does entail R wedge S. Notice A to C was true, was, was a yes answer, because if both parts are true, it does follow that at least one part is true. But did C entail A? No, it didn't. We found two counterexamples, and that's because if all you know is that at least one part is true, it doesn't follow that both parts are true. Okay, so let's get to the true-false questions that we have here. If you understand the basic idea of entailment, then these are actually not difficult true-false questions. Notice uh, we start with tautologies only entail other tautologies. And then 12 is tautologies are only entailed by other tautologies. So the next point that's worth making is the difference between A entails B and A is entailed by B. This is a grammatical issue, not really a logical issue, but I know that it's something that gives people trouble with these questions. When you say A entails B, how would you write that in symbols? That means A turnstile B. How would you represent A is entailed by B? That would be B turnstile A. So if you have this in mind, now read tautologies only entail other tautologies. So we're asking, and, and we're asking if you have a tautology, would it only entail another tautology? The easiest way to deal with this, and remember for all these questions, I invite you to just start with a line and get your pencil busy. So I would say we're talking, let's put a tautology on here. Here's a tautology. 
Does a tautology only entail other tautologies? Well, we can put some other things here. Here's a contingency, true, false, true, false. Here's a contradiction, false, 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 false. And just for the heck of it, let's put another tautology as well. Does the tautology entail the contingency? Well, obviously not, because right there you have counterexamples. Does the tautology entail the contradiction? Obviously not. Every single row is a, con is a counterexample. So a tautology only entails another tautology? Yep, that is true. Because from a tautology to anything else, you would have a counterexample. But now we're saying tautologies are only entailed by other tautologies. Well, now we're thinking the other direction. What would entail a tautology? This time it's probably easier to be thinking in terms of this one, because we're asking would one of these other formulas entail the tautology? Would a contingency entail a tautology? True to true, false to true, true to true, false to true. There's no way you'll ever get a t to f because the tautology is always true. So yes, a contingency will entail a tautology and so will a contradiction. So tautologies are only entailed by other tautologies? False. Tautologies can be entailed by anything else. In fact, everything entails a tautology. How about contradictions only entail other contradictions? Well, hopefully you know that that's false. One fact that you should know about contradictions is that anything follows from a contradiction. So let's put the contradiction out in front because we're asking what do contradictions entail? It says contradictions only entail other, other contradictions, but does the contradiction entail the tautology? Yes, it definitely does. No counterexample on any row. Does the contradiction entail the contingency? Of course it does. So contradictions only entail other contradictions? False. Contradictions are only entailed by other contradictions. Well, consider this one. Does the tautology entail the contradiction? No, it doesn't, because we get counterexample on each row. The t to f always means no. So the tautology doesn't entail the contradiction. Does the contingency entail the contradiction? Once again, if you have a t to f, you're going to answer no, so a contingency can't entail a contradiction. What would entail a contradiction? Only another contradiction. So co contradictions are only entailed by other contradictions? That's true. All right, so a fair bit of mental juggling here, a bit of being careful about your grammar. Um, but otherwise, these four sentences are all captured just by thinking about a contradiction, a tautology, and a contingency. These next four sentences are about logical equivalence. We know what logical equivalence is, right? If you had a formula A and a formula B, they would be logically equivalent if and only if they were identical. So true, false, true, false, if that's what you had under A, to be logically equivalent, what would you have to have under B? The exact same thing on every single row. True, false, true, false. Formulas are like recipes. And if recipes produce the very same outcome, then they're equivalent to each other. So 15, all contradictions are logically equivalent to each other. Well, think about a contradiction on a table. A standard contradiction is of the form p and tilde p. What do you get underneath a contradiction on a table? You always get all falses. So if I had another contradiction over here, let's say that I extended this and I, can, I had another contradiction and it was something like completely different letters, like say r arrow r, which is a tautology, but then it was negated so that it gave me a contradiction, it would always be falses as well. 
every contradiction is always going to have false underneath the main connective. And to be logically equivalent just is to have identical columns underneath your main connectives. So yes, every contradiction is logically equivalent to every other. Notice this is surprising because a contradiction, two contradictions might not have any of the same sentence letters and yet they're going to be identical. As recipes for combining truth values, every contradiction does the very same thing. It always outputs falses. And that's all that equivalence is about. So yes, all contradictions are logically equivalent to each other. That is a true sentence. All tautologies are logically equivalent to each other? Well, I don't even think I need to draw a picture for that at this point. Tautologies are always true, and so yes, every tautology is going to be equivalent to every other tautology. All contingencies are logically equivalent to each other. Well, hopefully that's equally obvious that this is false. Now here are two contingencies, and these are definitely equivalent to each other. But let's add another contingency over here. Call it C. True, true, false, false. Is C equivalent to A or B? No, it's not. And yet, obviously, they're all contingencies. And so all contingencies are logically equivalent. Obviously false. And finally, no two contingencies are logically equivalent. Well, that's just crazy. Here are two contingencies. They're logically equivalent to each other. And so no two t contingencies are logically equivalent. Clearly false. Logical equivalence is one of the simplest concepts in, that we deal with. And the tables are nice because they make concepts like this so clear. These next two sentences are about the relationship between entailment and equivalence. Number 19 is actually a fact that you probably just ought to know. If two formulas entail each other, then they must be logically equivalent. Well, in fact, you should just know that mutual entailment, entailing each other, equals logical equivalence. But let's explain why this is the case, make it really obvious, because that's what the tables are good for. Mutual entailment equals logical equivalence. Imagine that two formulas are logically equivalent to each other. So you've got, say, true, false, true, false. Should put the top of a table here. Let's just call this formula P, and then we'll call this other one Q. And we'll say that it's two equivalent formulas, true, false, true, false. If P is equivalent to Q, does P entail Q? Well, remember, the only way it doesn't entail is if you find a T to F. But if they're equivalent to each other, there's no way you're going to find a T to F when you compare them. Not in this direction or in the other direction. So if they're logically equivalent, they're clearly going to entail each other. And if they entail each other so that there's never a case of T to F, well, the only way that can happen is if they're logically equivalent. So 19 is definitely true. Sentence 20 is a little trickier. If two formulas P and Q both entail a third formula, then P and Q must be logically equivalent. I think with a sentence like this, sometimes it's hard to even know where to start. But that's why I always say when you're using the, a diagram to sort of help you understand the true-false questions, just get your pencil going. Two formulas P and Q. Well, just put P and Q at the top and say, okay, I got two formulas to deal with. In fact, I've got a third formula. Why don't we just call it R? We've got a P, Q, and an R. If two formulas P and Q both entail a third formula, then they have to be equivalent. If you're stumped about where to start, do something like this. Just say, I, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just going to put in true, false, false, true, true, false. I, you know, who cares? I'm going to put in something. Just put in some values and then start thinking about them. This gives you a framework to get your mind working. So now you can say, okay, well, if both entail a third formula, well, let me ask, 
Did I create a situation where P entails R? Here's true to true, false to false. Okay, so I've got P entails R. Do I have Q entailing R? False to true, true. No, nope, I have a problem here. Q does not entail R. All right, well, what would be the easiest thing to adjust so that I can make Q entail R? Well, I need to make it so that there's no F over here. What if I just made this? Okay, so I just turned R into a tautology. Well, now P still entails R and Q still entails R. Are P and Q equivalent to each other? Ah, no, they're not because they're not identical. What I did was kind of just stumble into an answer to my question. If two formulas, P and Q, entail a third formula, then they have to be equivalent? No, this is false. And this table shows it because P entails R, Q entails R, but they're not equivalent to each other. I did this kind of sloppily and I did it that way intentionally because I really, on some of these trickier questions, I think you want to start putting information on paper and then sort of play with it and let it help your thought processes. It, it, I mean, it's almost like the paper is giving you extra computer processing power for your brain in a, in a silly way. Now we have three sentences about consistency. Um, so let's do a quick review of the concept of logical consistency. For a set of formulas to be consistent, it basically means that it's possible for them all to be true at the same time. To determine if a set can all be true at the same time, what you're looking for is a row of t's all the way across. Because each row is, you might think of each row as a possibility. It's a way of interpreting the set. And so you look at each row. If you find a row of t's all the way across, then the set is consistent because it's possible for them to be true all together. So, is this set A, B, C, and D consistent? It's not. There's no row of T's all the way across. So forget about D. Is the row, is the set A, B, and C consistent? And the answer is yes it is because there's a row of T's all the way across right there. So consistency is a very simple concept. If all the members of a set of formulas are tautologies, then the set must be consistent. Well, I hope that's just enormously obvious. If they're all tautologies, then they're all T's all the way down, right? So if they're all T's everywhere, you're going to have a row. That's all you're going to have is rows of T's. And so if the, set of a for if the members of a set of formulas are all tautologies, then yes, it's got to be consistent. 22. If a set of formulas contains a tautology, then the set must be consistent. All right. Well, this time, all we know is that we've got one tautology in the set. Let's go back to this original set of stuff that we had over here. Not cross out D, not cross out that. And this will be really simple to understand if we say, well, let's take this set and we'll add a sentence E and we'll make it a tautology. Would this set be logically consistent? And the answer is no. Having one tautology is not sufficient to make it consistent because we're not looking for columns, we're looking for rows of T's. And so if a set of formulas contains a tautology, the set must be consistent. That is false. And finally, if a set of formulas contains a contradiction, then the set must be inconsistent. Now notice that's a trickier one. So if it contains a tautology, it doesn't have to be consistent. But what if it contains a contradiction? So let's get rid of the tautology here and turn that into a contradiction. False, 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 false. Is this set going to be consistent? No. 
if you have a contradiction, it really doesn't matter what the rest of the set is because a contradiction is never true and so any set that contains a, consist a contradiction cannot have a row of t's all the way across. In fact, one way to think about it is that a contradiction isn't even consistent with itself. And so if a set of formulas contains a contradiction, then it's inconsistent. That is actually true. These next five sentences, they kind of all involve factoids that one probably ought to know about tautologies and contradictions. Uh, first of all, the following formulas are all tautologies. Yes, P wedge tilde P, that means something like uh, it will rain or it won't rain. Um, pigs can fly or they can't fly. I like purple or I don't like purple. It doesn't matter what P stands for, this formula is always going to be true just because, it's struck, because of its structure. The same thing as for P arrow P. If I like purple, then I like purple. If there is a poodle in this room, then there's a poodle in this room. Um, if, if pigs can fly, then pigs can fly. If they can, then they can. So P double arrow P, that's obviously just P arrow P going both ways. Pigs can fly if and only if pigs can fly. Logic is my favorite subject in the world if and only if logic is my favorite subject in the world. You get the idea. These are facts that you should know. What's our standard contradiction, by the way? P ampersand tilde P. Uh, so, yes, this was a true sentence. Every tautology contains at least one repeated sentence letter. Well, notice all of our standard forms contain a repeated sentence letter. Does that mean that every tautology contains a repeated sentence letter? Well, in fact, it is true. If you see a formula like A arrow B ampersand tilde C ampersand D, I don't know, put those wherever you want. If you have a formula where you have completely, where, the, where there are no repeated sentence letters, then you immediately know that it has to be a contingency. Tautologies and contradictions involve the repetition of at least one sentence letter. So every tautology contains at least one repeated sentence letter? That is true. No contingencies contain any repeated sentence letters. No, that's obviously false. Um, having a repeated sentence letter doesn't mean you have to be a tautology. Consider this, A ampersand A. Well, that's just equivalent to A by itself. So repeated sentence letters don't make you a tautology. But to be a tautology, you have to have repeated sentence letters. Every simple sentence is a contingency. This is true. Every simple sentence, that's just like taking a single sentence letter, every simple sentence could be true, could be false. The sky is purple. Eh, that could be true, it could be false. Janet likes jello. Could be true, could be false. The speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. Physics says it's true, but from the perspective of logic, that could have been true, or it could have been false. You might want to say, well, as a matter of fact, it turned out to be true, but from a logical perspective, it didn't have to be true. Could have been true, could have been false. Um, the same thing is true for a sentence like, everybody dies. Well, as a matter of fact, in the real world, that's true, but from a logical perspective, it's the sort of thing that could be true, could be false. It's called a contingency because whether or not it's actually true is contingent upon the way the, app, the world actually works. So every simple sentence is a contingency is definitely true. Um, and now this one looks a little peculiar. D arrow Z arrow N and N arrow D is a contradiction. This is false. Why is it false? Well, it's another piece of information that you just want to know about. To be a contradiction, you have to have at least one tilde someplace. So when you look at this formula and you don't see any tildes, then you immediately know 
that it can't be a contradiction. Is it a tautology or is it a contingency? Well, that's trickier. You would, uh, I'll, I'll leave it as a project here. You have to do the table to figure out if this is a tautology or a contingency. But you can immediately tell that it's not a contradiction. These next two sentences can certainly be tricky. No disjunction is logically equivalent to any conditional. Well, I'm not really sure how the table is supposed to help you out on this. Um, but is it possible to have a disjunction, which is a wedge, that is logically equivalent to a conditional, which is a formula that has an arrow as its main connective? It might be that you just know that this is the case because P arrow Q is logically equivalent to what? Tilde P wedge Q. When we've talked about trees, we have mentioned that these things are equivalent because when what's the tree rule for an arrow? It's a branching rule with tilde P wedge Q. It also turns out that P wedge Q is logically equivalent to tilde P arrow Q. So yes, a disjunction and a conditional are always equivalent to each other. There's another fact I suppose that I could mention here. It turns out that there's a lot of redundancy in our system. Ampersand, wedge, arrow, double arrow, and tilde. If you are creative and oftentimes very ornate, you can create a formula that has anything as its main connective and you could create another formula that has the alternative thing as its main connective and you could make them logically equivalent to each other. I know that sounds surprising but you could have formulas of any different connectives that are still logically equivalent to each other. Finally, no tautology has an ampersand as its main connective. Well, for this one, I think what you have to do is say, well, I want to have something that's a tautology and it has an ampersand as its main connective. So I'd do a table for it and I'd have to get all t's underneath the ampersand. Well, the only way to get t's underneath the ampersand would be to have t's on both sides. So basically, I would need all t's over there, I'd need all t's over here. If I had that, then I would get all t's under the ampersand. Is it possible to do this? Well, in fact, it's really not very hard once you've seen it that way. Just put a tautology on this side, then you could put the same one, or if you wanted to, you could put a different one, say p wedge tilde p. Aha! Here is a formula that has its ampersand as its main connective, and yet it is a tautology. Of course, what it is is the conjunction of two other tautologies, but it does satisfy the sentence. So, let's see, I forgot to write. No disjunction is logically equivalent to any conditional. That was false. And no tautology has an ampersand as its main connective. That is also false. All right, uh, good luck with the studying.